The sockeye are waiting. They've left the wide Pacific, climbed river currents for hundreds of kilometers, and here, so close to their birthplace goal, they've had to stop, to hold, waiting for the river ahead to cool. But the sockeye's time is running out. Their ocean-built reserves are waning. They have little more energy left than what they will need to spawn. And they are so, so close to the gravels of the Adams River that will be the nursery for their eggs in the winter to come. On this bright fall day in late October, I'm on the shores of the Adams River in the Shuswap Lake country of central British Columbia, the traditional territory of the Sequepam peoples. I've come to see the sockeye salmon as they spawn. Sockeye runs are iconic, and the Adams River run is the most famous in all of British Columbia. But the sockeye aren't here yet. Climate change is hitting hard. This autumn is the warmest on record, and a drought hangs over British Columbia. The Fraser River is running warm and low. Sockeye, like all Pacific salmon, thrive in cold waters. So the sockeye have had to wait for the Fraser to cool. And now, those that have made it up the Fraser and Thompson Rivers are holding in the cooler depths of Shuswap Lake, at the mouth of the Adams River, waiting for the temperature to drop. So the sockeye wait, and the rest of us wait for the sockeye. And these sockeye have come a long way. For the past three years, these sockeye, born in the Adams River, have ranged far and wide across the North Pacific Ocean, feeding on the rich bounty of tiny animal plankton. And then this summer, as their four-year life cycle enters its last stage, they headed east, towards the British Columbia coast, and into the Salish Sea where they ran a gauntlet of recreational and commercial fishers and hungry sea lions and seals. By September, the sockeye were schooling at the mouth of the Fraser River, but the river was too warm to enter. Finally, just weeks ago in late September, the river had cooled enough. And into the river they swam, through the noise and din of industrial Vancouver, into the Fraser River's deep canyon, turning east into the clear flow of the Thompson River, following all the while the scent of their home stream with their extraordinary noses, and yet also struggling with the shock of fresh water, no longer eating, but drawing instead on the fat and protein reserves built over years at sea, driven on by the urge to return to the place where they were born. And then, nearly two weeks after leaving Saltwater, they reached the mouth of the Adams River, the very place where they began life as eggs. It's two weeks after my first visit, and I'm back at the Adams River. Word came that the sockeye had moved in, and I got here as fast as I could. And so did many, many others. Because every fourth year, 2010, 2014, 2018, and this year, 2022, Adams River sockeye return in much, much bigger numbers. And here at Jutweth Provincial Park on the banks of the Adams River, a festival every four years welcomes home these huge numbers of returning salmon. People by the thousands come to witness the river alive with sockeye. The Adams River is a short river connecting two large lakes. Water spills into the river from Adams Lake and is carried downstream 11 kilometers into Shuswap Lake. Most of the sockeye spawn in the lower reaches of the river. And it's here around the sockeye spawning beds that the festival is centered. I'm at the mouth of the Adams River where it flows into Shuswap Lake. The festival is underway upstream and it's been fun to visit. But now I'm keen to be alone with the sockeye. Below me, red sockeye shimmer as they head upstream. My underwater camera is attached to a long pole. 
So I find an eddy filled with sockeye and slip my camera in. <laughs> oh my, they're beautiful. Bright crimson bodies, olive green heads, and so streamlined to the river's flow. The current strong sand grains whip by, yet the sockeye hold themselves against the river with what seems to be so little effort. I sort out who's who. Females are smaller than males and still have their sleek shape that they had in ocean life. Males, on the other hand, are larger than females and have changed dramatically from their shape in the ocean. Their jaws are hooked, their teeth exaggerated, and now have grown great humps on their back. The school of sockeye I'm watching move on upstream, so I head that way too, along a forest path that follows the river, pausing here and there to admire the fall colors. I come upon a view where the river lies beyond a broad gravel bar cut by channels. During the spring high water when the river fills with snow melt, this bar is submerged, a part of the river bottom. The gravel tumbles along, dragged by the river's current. Then, through the summer and fall, as the flow wanes and river levels drop, gravel bars emerge, separated by smaller channels. And it's these small channels of the Adams River that are the favored spawning grounds for the sockeye. I head out across the bar to the edge of the main channel. The sockeye here are spread out as singles and pairs, the mark of a spawning bed. Salmon reproduce by females and males simultaneously releasing eggs and sperm-filled milt into a nest dug in the river gravels. This is spawning. And a spawning bed is an area of the gravel river bottom chosen by females to dig their nests. Over the coming winter, the spawning bed will become a nursery where the eggs within the gravel mature and in the spring hatch into tiny salmon. I slip my camera in beside the closest pair. The smaller and sleek female is so different from the larger male with his big hump back and hooked jaw. The female's busy digging her nest, or red as the nest's called laying over on her side, sweeping up with her tail, lifting the sand and finer gravel and letting the current carry it away, leaving behind the coarser gravel for her nest. She sought out gravels of the right size, large enough so the spaces between the pebbles can hold the eggs she's about to lay. The male stays close to her, as other males hover nearby. But this male holds his dominant position likely because he's bigger and stronger than his challengers. I'm struck by how aggressively the female defends her nest area from other females, as other females are also building nests nearby. The female has to defend her nest Otherwise, other females will inadvertently destroy her eggs as they dig. And right beside me, I see this damage done. A female sweeps to dig her nest and stirs up sockeye eggs from an earlier built nest. This jockeying and defending goes on and on. Eventually, each female will lay about 4,000 eggs typically digging four to six separate nests within the larger red area. And each time she deposits eggs, males will be there to fertilize them with their milky sperm. Over the course of this salmon run, nest building and egg laying will happen tens of thousands of times, over several weeks and throughout the many channels of the Adams River. The river's just alive with fish.
As my camera moves through the shallows, I notice other details of the river. Minnows dance where the current is weaker, darting here and there to catch edible bits. And stray sockeye eggs collect in the eddies, eggs that have escaped from egg laying upstream or perhaps dug up by later nest building. Once these eggs are on the loose, they have little chance of survival. Most will be eaten by fish and birds. I turn and head downstream along the bar. A dead female floats along the shore and I'm struck by how alive her eyes remain, staring up at me. A little further along is a dead male. His nostril catches my attention. This is his remarkable nose that allowed him to find his way all the way here from the ocean. And there are more carcasses in various states of decay, strewn amid the spawning energy that is creating new life. Because it's the way of salmon that they die shortly after spawning. They're spent. The fat reserves that they've drawn on since they left the ocean are exhausted. They haven't eaten for weeks. Their ocean-built bodies, adapted to salt water not fresh, are in decay. This is the bittersweet reality of the spawning beds. I continue on. The river ahead splits into channels between gravel bars. Trees eroded from riverbanks upstream litter the bars. I notice gulls flocking downstream. Gulls never congregate without a reason, so I head their way. And, just as I guessed, they're feasting on salmon carcasses. The sockeye circle of life is taking another step. Now they're feeding others. Around the next bend, and eagles on another sockeye carcass. I pause behind some tree debris and watch. Eagles fly long distances to feast on salmon runs, whether here in the interior of British Columbia or along the coast. And late fall salmon runs like the Adams provide critical feeding just before eagles go into the leaner winter months. I look back upstream, just above a riffle Two ducks and a gull catch my attention. Around them, I see the fins of spawning sockeye. The ducks and gull are pecking away in the spawning bed at something on the river bottom, and I'm betting they're hunting stray sockeye eggs. And a merganser duck is doing the same. Even for these big birds, the eggs, though small in size, are packed with fat and calories, and an energy bonanza. I head back along the forest path to the lake. I watch an eagle, and I'm reminded that the nutrients from the dying salmon brought from the ocean feed the whole web of life along the river. With every egg laying of a bug, feces from a mink or otter, or death of an eagle or gull, nutrients from the salmon are spread out into the surrounding forests and soils. Through the work of the sockeye, the ocean feeds the forest. These are sockeye forests. Back at the river mouth, the river's washing carcasses and eggs down into Shushwap Lake, feeding and fertilizing algae, bacteria, and bugs that are the very foundation of the food web of the lake. And it's here into Shushwap Lake that next spring, the young salmon will head when they rise from the river gravels for the lake will be their home for the first year of their life, feeding on its tiny algae and bugs before heading to the sea in their second year. So the dying sockeye fertilize the very lake where their offspring will need to feed in the year to come. For this is the way of the sockeye. My thoughts wander as I stare out across the lake. I marvel. What beautiful, inspiring creatures. That they live spread out across the broad North Pacific for years, then each navigate their way across thousands of kilometers to find the Fraser River, and then with stunning tenacity, work their way upstream against the river's flow for hundreds of kilometers, 
no longer eating, choosing their way by the subtle smells of the current, and that they can find among the thousands of streams to choose from the very river of their birth, and that hundreds of thousands of sockeye are able to do this all arriving together. I just marvel. <laughs>